So the real question of the book is, is what happened? <laughs> what happened to British politics? Uh, how has it become so deranged that a former Conservative Secretary of State, Rory Stewart, reports that many of the political decisions he witnessed after 2010 were, and I quote, rushed, flaky and poorly considered, the lack of mature judgment palpable, the consequences frequently catastrophic. Why have recent Conservative Prime Ministers become more apparently comfortable telling open falsehoods than engaging with the very evident public emergencies that we face from climate change to uh, housing? How has the British state itself, after 40 years of pro-market reforms, become not less but more centralised and more rigidly bureaucratic? So, in short, why have British governments become so remarkably bad at problem solving and why has social reality become an almost constant source of embarrassment to British party politics and to conservative politics in particular? And what I want to do uh, with the book is offer a systematic account of these developments. Now, the title on the face of it is completely strange and counterintuitive, right? The Cold War and its aftermath taught us that Soviet socialism and neoliberalism or Thatcherism in the British context are absolute ideological opposites and who could possibly uh, disagree. So their everyday political values could not have been further apart, but my point is they are exact opposites. Ask how they understand the nature of political economic reality and this dichotomy proves false. On closer inspection, both Soviet and neoliberal doctrines are based on closed system forms of economic reasoning about society. They are built on purely logical arguments from utopian, assumption, uh, uh, utopian assumptions. So they're built on axiomatic deduction rather than on arguments from observation and reasoned analysis, otherwise known as hypothetical deduction, more commonly known as the scientific method. So, Britain's neoliberal economic policies have typically been based on neoclassical economic theories, and both neoclassical and Soviet economics essentially assert that there are predetermined laws of the economy that each doctrine alone can apprehend, and both schemes assume the operation of a universal and consistent rationality, or be that rationality uh, has opposing forms, so a consistent fraternity in the Soviet case versus a constantly rational self-interest in the neoliberal case. So what I demonstrate in the book is that Soviet economics of the Stalinist era and post-Stalinist era and neoclassical economics are essentially mirror images and of the two, neoliberalism is the more completely dehistoricized. In the philosophy of science, the critical realist perspective focuses on our assumptions about the nature of reality, the problem of ontology and the methods we choose to understand it, otherwise known as the problem of epistemology. So by exploring the differences between the natural and the social sciences, I argue from a critical realist position that it is simply not humanly possible to discern a governing social science, a blueprint for government that would be good for all times and places. Why can't we do this? Well, because there's no Archimedean point where we can stand to ascertain how exactly society reached the place that it has reached. We can't transcend the history of our own curiosity. Each theory we have evolves out of the theories uh, that came before it. On top of all this, the very fact of human imagination and of radical uncertainty in human affairs and of emerging novelty in complex systems means that even if we were to attain the godlike uh, understanding of the past uh, that uh, governing science implies, the future is going to be different anyway. Human societies are open, evolving and inescapably uncertain systems and for better or worse, our freedoms reside in that openness. It is as such the unique virtue of liberal democracy as a political system that it's based principally on inclusive decision rules and that in turn allows us a unique capacity for adaptive learning, but only it seems so long as its political parties remain free of utopian dogmas. <laughs>
unfortunately for us, both Soviet and neoliberal doctrines are utopian political philosophies dressed up as science. And when you apply their deterministic strategies in practice, you are doomed to produce a rising tide of unanticipated social and economic consequences and new institutional dynamics that bear practically no resemblance to those of ideological promise. So both neoliberal and Soviet orthodoxies are tautological, circular in their reasoning. Their actions follow from the, uh, sorry, the actions that follow from their assumptions are valid as distinct from true by virtue only of their logical formulation. And their end goals are consequently as impossible to realize as they are to refute. What I hope that opening discussion in the book also reveals is that the ostensibly more skeptical neoclassical uh, diagnoses adopted by New Labour, so diagnoses that accepted the possibility of market failures, are really hardly less utopian than the first best world assumptions of the new right. Why is that? Well, because if you assume that by mending microeconomic points of market failure, you move the uh, economy closer to the efficient ideal, then you are still confusing a logical movement in a formal model with the possible and hence actual dynamics of a real capitalist economy. So at the heart of both utopias sits the neoliberal uh, promise of uh, allocative, sorry, in the heart of both utopias sits the promise of allocative efficiency. And in chapter three, I focus on the theory of general equilibrium, in, which is obviously a mainstay of neoliberal argument, which argues that the price mechanism is supposed to allow all markets to clear so that uh, supply and demand in the economy will be exactly matched. Now, the Soviet theory of balanced planning is rooted in Marxist economic sociology rather than in the mathematics of neoclassical economics. But this chapter explores how the circular nature of the reasoning behind uh, these arguments uh, essentially produces mirror image theories of allocative efficiency. So I look at how the Stalinist command planning of the 1930s and the neoliberal shift of the late 1970s confronted first Soviet economists and later their neoclassical cousins in the West with the same challenge. And that challenge is, how do you turn a dogma into a procedure? How do you reproduce essentially machine-like models of allocative efficiency in social reality? And this was bound to prove difficult. The formal neoclassical existence proof for general equilibrium by Arrow and Dubrow in 1954 requires, for example, that all economic agents hold perfect information about all past, present and future prices and all trades have to take place at the beginning of time, conditions that Arrow himself described as obviously impossible. This is a mathematical thought experiment. By the 1970s, Sonnenschein, Mantel and Dubrow had refuted general equilibrium as even mathematically completely incoherent. The victory of Stalinist central planning and neo neoliberalism would nevertheless drive later generations of both Soviet and neoclassical economists trudging up the same Escher staircase of questions as to why efficient allocation must be lost when information was lost and how it might be possible to restore it. So it is remarkably at this point in the 1970s with general equilibrium already disproved as even theoretically incoherent that neoliberalism rises to the fore with the promise that a constant tendency to allocative efficiency will follow as the latent property of markets as the state is gradually withdrawn. And that assumption is in the small print of practically every neoliberal policy from tax competition to deregulation to benefit cuts. Now in the final part of this theoretical section, I look at how the application of neoclassical economic logic to the political realm through so-called public choice theory would go on to provide pure assertions about the inevitable failures of the liberal democratic state. Public choice reasoning allowed new right academic theorists to argue that bureaucratic agents as functional monopolists would rationally increase their budgets and authority to a potentially endless degree and voters would only upwardly bid their state-based privileges all at the creeping expense of the private sector and ultimately then of freedom. My point, however, is that we shouldn't be surprised to find that the rallying cry of the new right was that bureaucracy, 
So Michael Gove's notorious blob that we hear so much about in contemporary British politics, that the bureaucracy always operates as the real seat of power in a liberal democracy. Why should we not be surprised? Because it's an exact mirror, an exact counterpart to the Leninist argument about bureaucracy as the stronghold of bourgeois class interests. And it is necessarily the case. In both cases, the structures of the modern democratic state are read entirely through a utopian materialist lens. And it is predetermined in both theories that the bourgeois democratic state must stand as a structural impediment to the soon to be revealed Eden of materialist promise. In the British case, a civil service built on the Haldane principles of policy making from observation and the scientific method could not but stand in the way of the neoliberal marketplace, whether conceived in Hayekian or neoclassical terms. So when Thatcher declared uh, a man's right, and I quote, to have the state as servant, not as master, she presumably had no idea that Friedrich Engels had also railed against the transformation of the state from servants, into, uh, from servants of society into masters of society, which is why Lenin had quoted him saying that in The State and Revolution. It follows that these affinities continue into the respective visions of the preferred constitutional order, the withering away of the state to reveal the self-regulating economy of perpetual peace, supposedly unhindered by vested interests or opportunistic behaviours of any kind. It follows that since 1979, we have been taught a series of brutal lessons about what goes wrong when you attempt to translate the fantasy of a self-regulating, more or less Judeo-Christian Eden in materialist form into a real political economy populated by actual human beings, fallible and vulnerable and generous as we are. In practice, these doctrines impose a systematic practice of organised forgetting the omission and rejection of knowledge that refuses to conform to the utopian reality. So in claiming to have solved the riddle of history with a governing science, both Soviet and neoliberal ideologies would attack their political opponents, not as legitimate opponents in a democracy, but as primitives unschooled in their singular methods of reasoning. Both Soviet and neoliberal doctrines are nevertheless more accurately understood as working against the scientific method dependent as they are on arguments from utopian assumption, as distinct from arguments based on evidence, theoretical review and adaptation. In this light, it becomes less surprising that after 40 years of this orthodoxy, Britain's political parties and the state they have created have become so poor at comprehending the complex, dynamic, interdependent nature of the political economy, so unwilling to act strategically to improve it and so obstinate in refusing to engage the full range of institutional possibilities at their disposal. It turns out that a great deal gets lost analytically when governments move from thinking empirically about complex systems to relying instead on decision-making models that assume an unchanging mode of human rationality and fixed economic laws. When we move from the necessarily imperfect art of government to a pseudo-science about the efficient allocation of things. So I'm going to go faster in summarising the middle and the final sections of the book. So the middle chapters of the book look at the impractical realities of Britain's neoliberal, neoliberal revolution. So I begin by looking at the new public management and the reforms of the state itself. So if you consider, for example, the theories and practice of public sector outsourcing, privatisation and firm-like agentification within the civil service, it becomes apparent that while the second best neoclassical theories of market failure can help us understand the kind of contractual and regulatory pro problems that are plagued to those policies at the microeconomic level, it's the lessons of Soviet enterprise planning that tell us more about why these problems cannot substantively be resolved. So, for example, if you strip away the market rhetoric around public sector outsourcing, you can see more clearly that the neoliberal state has simply become a giant of centralised enterprise planning and procurement. And hence, it is Soviet planning failures that best illuminate 
why public sector outsourcing over time induces bargaining games between firms and firm-like agencies that the state cannot win, dependent on those firms as it becomes. Ironically, it is Soviet economic history that can tell us why the endless attempts by governments to apply remedial regulations based on targets and output plans will only create an ever more rigid exoskeleton of bureaucracy while doing very little to solve the underlying framework based on a utopian set of assumptions as it is. It is Soviet economic history that consequently helps to explain the emergence of firefighting, informal state corporate relationships throughout the state that are then immensely vulnerable to corruption, exactly as they were in the USSR. I look next at the deepening systemic crisis throughout Britain's welfare state. So I explore the theory of quasi-markets with a chapter on the rise of academy schools. Now, academy schools were initially a new labour innovation, um, but their history illustrates what it means to confuse an abstract theor theoretical map based on closed system reasoning for the open social terrain. So the new labour choice and competition agenda was originally conceived in arguments about the, rel the relative benefit for end users of publicly funded but privately provided welfare services. However, as an abstract model and argument about a marketplace of users and providers, it effectively wished away the state and the real consequences for education policy when the state becomes a disempowered and yet still financially liable planner of outsourced educational enterprises now governed through private contract. Far from the liberation of teachers and schools promised again by Michael Gove as he rolled out this system way beyond Labour's more experimental intentions, academization has contrived to create the worst of public and private regimes. The exploitation of incomplete contracts by producers, informational fragmentation, the gaming of targets, a really severe loss of public accountability, financial corruption and increasingly Kafkaesque efforts at bureaucratic remedy, all reminiscent of Soviet enterprise failures. And I think together this helps, helps explain what is now a really severe retention crisis for teachers in British schools. Turn in fact to any major policy reform of the last 40 years and you will find the steady development of Soviet pathologies in capitalist form. Explore the Treasury's tax models and you discover how their assumptions mirror Soviet assumptions and even share the same exchange economy methodologies of input-output planning. Methodologies such as computational general equilibrium models that cannot even imagine financial markets and hence simply don't include them. Accept that not all large corporations are honourable stewards of social productivity, however, and it then becomes less surprising that the practice of lowering corporate taxation combined with maximising shareholder value has produced more private financial extraction rather than more investment and higher productivity. Most dangerously of all, successive UK governments have applied the most utopian neoclassical approaches to climate policy, with a governmental framework that understands risk as something that can be calculated, modelled and hence integrated and managed within market mechanisms by essentially rational market actors. As a framework, however, this superimposes an entirely abstract neoclassical framework of reasoning onto the all too real and current breakdown of biophysical systems. It gives us illusions of control, the unprecedented nature of the ecological emergency notwithstanding, and it drives us away from the strategic long-term thinking and precautionary principles that a more reasoning society would adopt. The final chapters, you'll be glad to hear, Look at the consequences of the neoliberal materialist utopia for British politics and for British political culture. British neoliberalism, in absolute contrast to the Bolshevik Revolution and its history, was taken up by democratic parties in an open society and reinforced through a succession of entirely free and fair elections. So it would be very reasonable to assume that it is here in the political realm that these ideological affinities completely end, that the comparison is no longer useful. However, democratic political parties in Western Europe by the 1970s were already struggling to keep pace with the changing social needs and electoral preferences of their societies when neoliberalism emerged. 
and this social disembedding of parties in Britain would only worsen when neoclassical economics became the bipartisan methodology for government. Utopian assumptions were given the credibility of supposedly unchanging natural laws and the real electoral choices around the political economy were not just narrowed, but attached to promises that could never be realized in practice. In this light, it becomes less surprising that over the decades, as the many faceted promises of the Thatcherite revolution failed to materialize, that the Conservative Party, by now completely steeped in this economic orthodoxy, has embraced exactly the same political strategies as late Soviet regimes. As in the late, later Brezhnev years in the, in the USSR, Thatcher's original combat tasks of economic change have been increasingly substituted with the mobilizing strategies of nationalism and racism. And it becomes easier to see why the conservative governments that followed the global financial crisis have simply had to resort to demonstrable lies and invented realities to deflect from the real effects of policy and after 2016, um, the effects of its most utopian expression, namely Brexit. And I spend half of the penultimate chapter looking at Brexit, but in short, it is in essence an attempt at Bolshevik revolutionary completion after 35 years of failed neoliberal Menshevism, and it's gone about as well as that implies. Britain today languishes under a political economic orthodox orthodoxy that is at the height of its structural power, but built on a demonstrably mistaken blueprint that can no longer command any broad social support. But so long as the UK's parliamentary parties remain more or less committed to it, the country as a whole, I think, will suffer the necessarily conspiracy mongering and increasingly absurdist narratives also characteristic of the late Soviet era. It follows that the country stands at a really critical juncture with highly uncertain outcomes. So long as the political mainstream continues to confuse truly utopian radicalism for the center ground and to stay with a doctrine that fails to integrate the very basic existence of time, technological change, cooperation, culture, empathy, uncertainty, ethics, and best of all, imagination, I fear that our party political system is going to prove completely unable to find a renewed social purpose that stems from the actual conditions in which people live. To close then on this most cheery thought, I would say that in their philosophical determinism, both Soviet and Thatcherite economic promises, uh, sorry, economics promise a politics for the end of time. But in the midst of a deepening ecological emergency, the perpetuation of those fantasies can only hasten the end of actual human history for all time, for real, which, as the Poles used to say of communism, is terminal but not serious. Thank you very much.